Hello, ITGS kids out there. Today we'll be going through topic three of software. I uh, just finished my mock exam for English. I'm currently I'm not in a good mood. The questions asked are a bit strange, but I think I'll be fine. Yeah, five, six. Um, okay, that's my summative assessment. I'll show you guys that later. But first, let's just go through some key points for software. Um, so, okay, when we talk about software, we have to, let's talk about the bigger software, the bigger picture. You know, when you get a computer, it's raw, it has the, it has nothing on it. It doesn't have any application, none of those application software, no, um, no utility software, and not even a backup. You would just have a raw system, right? The operating system will be the backbone. So an operating system is responsible for managing and controlling all of the computer's hardware. When you first switch on a computer, you see its operating system first. You know, you ask you, would you like to set up Windows 7, and you, in this my case, Mac OS, and then you click enter, and then it starts setting up the, it starts opening up its packages. So, <clears throat> the, operating, the operating system also provides the user with an interface, uh, be that being, you know, either GUI, CLI, or uh, MDI. So, um, it sends instructions to all hardware and the external hardware of the computer. So, it's, it, for example, you open the task, it says, okay, we need RAM, and it will request for RAM from the hardware. So, which is why the important thing for OS is so the task and memory management. If multiple software are running at once, the operating system will manage this program in a way and it was assign them the specific resources they need and protect their data from, um, let's say, internet worms. And it also provides a security. For example, Mac OS, they, uh, you have to set up with a password. You have to set, in my case, you have to, you can, it is opt-in to that you can um, set up with biometrics, such as my fingerprint scanner. And my phone have a facial scanner, right? Um, yeah, and here we have providing user with interface. A GUI is what is most common. We see this. This is a GUI, a graphical user interface. Um, a CLI, a command line interface, will be what you need to see in terminal. And yes, I have Minecraft on my screen. <laughs> I was I had to help my friend. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, an MDI, a menu group, a men, menu. Gosh, I can't pronounce that. A manual driven interface. For example, when you have Lunch in the cafeteria, um, MD interface, let's just search up that. I cannot spell today, um, MD interface. So that would be, no, that would not be. Menu driven interface, let's give an example. Uh, for example, um, this an ATM will be menu driven interface where it has programmed buttons such that you can only do a specific amount of things and now that you do, you will now never go online with a ATM machine. That would be a bit weird. Okay, so now we have the another type of software that I would love to talk about, and that would be the utility software. This differentiation, backup programs, encryption system, system monitoring, monitoring, bleh, disk cleanup, accessibility options, antivirus, these are all very common. Uh, this, this, this fragmentation, I can't speak, I'm so sorry, is the process where um, it will reorganize your hard drive such that um, the free space in the hard drive are reduced to a specific sector. So uh, it will speed up the hard drive in, in, in a sense. Backing up, we know what backup does. We, it is recommended to backup regularly to create um, copies of data. We usually, we can set up a RAID, a uh, array of redundant disk, we learned that last chapter, and that will help um, the backing up process to be much easier. A lot of business, for example, like Amazon, if they lose their database, they are screwed. They have no information whatsoever about the seller, about where the product should go. They have no information about where the customer live or where they should even go pick up the product, which is why a lot of business, they will and definitely have already backed up their databases or their software. You know, they won't, we don't want to keep downloading things. Um, so data can be corrupted with a uh, hardware failure, software failure, or intentionally if someone has put a magnet next to your MacBook, then you're screwed. Um, 
Security and backup are as important as the data. You don't want your um, backup data to be accessed, which is why whenever I backup, I store them. I store them not in the iCloud. I store them not on my local computer. I store it on the external hard drive under my drawer, and then no one will ever find that that hard drive. So yeah, come on. Every backup contains some form of identifiable information. My backup contains all of my passwords. I will tell you my I will tell you my password if you ask me in the comments. Don't worry, I won't. <laughs> okay. Now we talk about we finished utility software, which is you know just the fragmentation and backing up. We can go on to the actual software, you know, open source, closed source, those those application softwares, those um let's okay, okay, let me read it out loud for you. The database software, presentation software. Most of these are kind of like um, application software because you open it, you do a specific specific application on it. So I don't know why I categorize them so distinctly. It's a bit strange. Anyways, um, so we have open source and closed source softwares. Um, so here's the comparison chart. Source code, in other words, the coding for the software. Open source, you can access it. You can access the original source code. You can change it. You can change it and redistribute it. You can even change it and then sell it. For example, oh, I programmed this program based off the other program, which is better than the other program. <laughs> it's pretty confusing, let's say. Okay, so you, you, you obtain program A that is free and open source. You changed it such that you improved something about it. And you can name it A prime. And then you can sell the A prime for money. Where in comparison, closed source, no, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to change it. You don't even have the access to the files. So for example, Adobe is really, really strict on accessing their code, which is why they have this huge Adobe Cloud monitoring everyone's Adobe um, usage. And no, they cannot do anything. You cannot edit, you cannot sell. No freedom. And freedom is false, then it's for free. Fuck. Uh, now we talk about the security. So as people can see the so source code, source code, <laughs> no, source code, Errors can be identified and fixed by a process in database we call it auditing, but I believe you can call it here as well, auditing. So uh, it will increase the stability of the software, in fact, by a test of um, a stress test of Linux, which is open source, and Windows, the stability of Linux came up on top because a lot of third party are constantly trying to improve the stability and security of Linux. So on the other hand, the closed source, though they are much more private, so which means that not many people will exploit the weaknesses. It also means that bugs and security breaches are 100% relied on your bug report. You report them and they might fix it in like a year or you know, best case scenario, two months, and that will be a bit annoying since any security breaches are a little bit um, off, out of hand, the day can go out of hand is what I mean, and it's very annoying overall. And transparency, no, it's not transparent. No, it's tra yes, it's transparent. So that will be a brief comparison about open source and closed source. Mm -hmm. um, now we talk about EULA. EULA stands for End User License Agreement. It's basically terms and condition of a software. You know, whenever you sign up for like an account, it will be like, oh, do you agree with the terms and conditions? And yes. There will be an end, end user license agreement. Oh gosh, agreement. Okay, now we have licenses. Here, I like to think about licenses like it's like a key card, or you know, like that movie scene when in Captain America when he when he when Nick Fury went uh, what is it, Project Insight, and then he was like, and then the elevator was like, Captain Rogers does not have access to this, so it's kind of like that. Uh, if you don't have a license, you can never access the full program. Um, there are three kinds of licenses. Single user, single user license, you can only use it once on one computer. Um, and then there's multiple user license, so you can install a number of times, a uh, fixed number of times, on a number of different devices. And then there's side license, which is basically installed on as many computers as you want and used by as many users as needed, provided that they're in the same organization. So which is why our school can provide all of us with Adobe because our school have a site license for the Adobe Suite. Uh, what type of protection mechanism out there? Now, there's serial number, which is, 
which is the most common type of licensing. That would be serial number. And then product activation code is similar to serial number, but it's a little bit different. We don't need to know the difference, but just know that these are two different things. And then we have the digital rights management. So it reduces illegal copies by, of disks by making copying it difficult, such that it can only run once. And it will require, let's say, a one-time password to access the program. Or simply, the, it requires the original disk, disk to be presented to be able to be installed. For, so for example, I, I, on my old computer, I had the Microsoft Office Suite. And I installed that from a 360 um, Office disk on my old computer. But I was unable to airdrop the application to this computer because they will not install unless I have the disk. And then we have uh, this Business Software Alliance and the Federation Against Software Thief. So these are real organizations and campaigns um, that are aimed to reduce legal copies. And sometimes they reward people who report cases of uh, copyright um, breach. OK, and then we talk about is FOSS always free? So now I'm talking about the free and open source up here. So no, uh, the essential, the backbone of the software is free. However, if this person, let's say, programmed an extra content on it, then he can charge for whatever he, you know, so forever, whatever he uh, coded. So now we have cloud-based and local-based data storage. So the advantage of cloud-based is, first of all, you can access it anywhere. There will be no maintenance needed, no upgrade cost, and no need for backup because uh, the server, like Google Docs, are constantly being backed up. And then it uh, also allows multiple users to work, work simultaneously on a document. But however, it does say that you need a reliable internet connection if a lot of users are going to use the system. Um, so it also rely on the service provider to have good security. And if, so basically, everything relies on uh, your internet connection and the uh, ability for your service provider or for the server provider to be adequate enough because you're relying on their backup, you're rely relying on their security, you're relying on their uh, privacy and, and surveillance. And legal status in different parts of the world is um, strange. So some international laws say that you can have this in your Google Doc, but some doesn't. But because Google Doc is a transnational, Google is transnational corporation, so therefore, its data should be protected under the cross-border law of data transfer. But yeah, software license, we talked about um, you know, single license, site license, and multiple user license. So we have uh, here we have different types of softwares. Commercial software, we know what those are. Uh, shareware, freeware, and public domain. The public domain is um, basically a software that is no longer under the Copyright Protection Act, but however, selling it is still a bit iffy because technically somebody else still coded and that comes under ethics for ITGS. Freeware, you can be distributed at no cost as long as the copyright is still maintained by the author. So you can um, give out whatever you want. So it's, it's kind of like Google Chrome. You can download it, you can airdrop it, but you just can't edit it. Shareware uh, will be like, I don't want to use WinRAR because WinRAR is a bad example. Uh, how about crossover? Crossover is an app that allows, is that, um, that creates a virtual machine or an emulator in a MacBook to simulate um, the environment of Windows. And every day, have a, every person has a 14 day trial. And after the 14 day, you will have to um, purchase to continue the use of this shareware. So that will be an example of shareware. Uh, and then we have, I did not type out here. So, Summative assessment, I'll just um, scroll through it briefly. You read it on yourself, just pause and read. So <clears throat> this will be an a mark question in the ITGS test. There and by the way, there is no by no means do you need, need to uh, give examples. It, like for you don't need to explain the examples. You can give some examples, but you don't have to. By no means do you need to go uh, this at this magnitude. And yeah, 
and that will conclude our chapter three and i will see you guys in chapter four